Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Better late than never, huh? Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Mitchell United Methodist Church. Please feel free to worship as the Spirit moves you this morning. Look forward to this morning. Are there any announcements? I have one. The Bible study on the book of Hebrews will begin in April. We asked everyone if you needed a book to see Nancy and give her six books. Well, if you waited, that sale ended. The price is now $11. We tried to tell you. So if you want the book, please contact Nancy and give her $11, and we will order the books. Are there any other announcements? I've got a couple. As you'll see on the back of your bulletin, the wind announcement is that the Are there any others? Then as you are able, well, let us please stand as the light of Christ enters our midst.
stand as you are able and join with us in singing hymn number 453, 453.
Are there any joys or prayer concerns? Well. This is Aaron. Aaron's having an emergency appendectomy. Been there, done that, ouch. Any others? Just for, for Joan, she's, uh, she's feeling better, but she's still got that cough. Continue to remember Joan. Any others? Continue to remember Brenda. Any others? For his Nana, she had a successful knee replacement Wednesday, but now she's on the other end of, of a healing. Yes, the physical therapy is the most important part, actually. Uh, I'd like to remember Joan in prayer as she's struggling with breathing issues. And uh, just pray for the choir as we venture into the Easter season and yes. try to uh, have nice music for everybody. We hope everyone can stay well. You always have wonderful music for us. Thank you. Angie Mendoza's mom. Yes. And also Brenda Prevett's mom. Yes. Mother-in-law. Yes. Remember Brenda Prevett's mother-in-law and Angie Mendoza's mother has been brought home in hospice care. So remember that family, not just her, but the entire family as they face this transition. Any others? Or Gina, as they've got to visit those three doctors before they can do surgery. Yes, Regina has three doctor's appointments before she can have surgery. Remember her and that family as well. Any others? Whenever you go through cancer, it is a family experience, not just one. It's the entire family. Any others? If you have an unspoken request that you would still like to give to God, let it be known by your sign of surrender. Lord, it's been another one of those weeks, but I know I wasn't alone. And knowing that you were there, I know that I can truly surrender all. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these people. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Just thank you. We praise your name for loving us that much. We praise you for all the things that you have given us in life. We praise you for still having the healing touch. For still being the great physician. And knowing that you are still the great physician and still healing, we leave all these petitions of healing in your hands. And we know that you will answer according to your plan. But we also know that you can strengthen a weary body, strengthen a weary soul and spirit. And Father, we call on you and we ask for those that need strength, whether it be of body or of mind or spirit, give them that strength. Strength, Father. For those, dear Lord, who do not know You through Your Son, Jesus Christ, and the actions on the cross for us who do not know Him as Savior. Father, we lift them up this morning. Let them come to a saving knowledge and enter into a personal relationship with You through Your Son. Now, Lord, we know that You're with us. And we know that You hear us. And we know that You will answer because we're going to ask it in Jesus' name. We leave all these petitions, whether spoken or unspoken, with You. And we claim them done by praying in the manner in which Your Son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we reaffirm our faith using the traditional Apostles' Creed located on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into heaven. I'm sorry. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. throughout our community, our country, and our world. And let all of God's children say, Amen. Our children will please come. That's not what it's about. 
It's about Christ dying in his resurrection. And those 40 days are preparing us for Easter so that we can get all the bad things that we've done, try to get it right with God, to examine ourselves, to look in our hearts. Is there anything in here that's wrong? So you've never done anything that you regretted doing? You have no idea. Have you ever done anything you got punished for? Yes. It was wrong, right? That opening at the Advent calendar, that was like a month or one or two months before Christmas. You opened the Advent calendar. Was it chocolate in it? No. Oh. It was a Lego Star Wars Advent calendar. Oh, Legos were in it. Okay. So you did something you weren't supposed to do. Yeah. And it wasn't so right. So that's what we do this time of year. If there's something that we have done, we are right. And I got yelled at first thing in the morning before I had to go to school. You got yelled at. Well, we as adults, when we do something wrong, we get yelled at too. But it's by God through His Spirit in our hearts saying, you shouldn't have done that. That's what your mother or your father said to you, right? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have done that. And we listen during these 40 days. We should listen all the time, but we set apart limits to listen and to examine. And if we have done something wrong, we repent. You know what that word means, repent? You say, I'm sorry. Have you ever done anything to, you had to say, I'm sorry to someone? Well, that's what Luke's all about. I punched someone at school. You got a lot of praying to do this thing. <laughs> but that's what Luke's all about. 40 days to see. Forgive me, Lord. Make me a better person. That's all for me. I bless this candy time.
continuation from Wednesday night and for all of you that were here for the pancake dinner and for Ash Wednesday service thank you, we had a very good turnout thank you for being here and it's actually going to be the same scripture but not the same message same scripture, different message from murder to mercy Psalm 51 1 through 17. It's a fairly brief message, but one that I feel that, well, it blessed me. I'll, I'll tell you that. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. And I won't read the little introduction part that we read Wednesday night. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. And if you're watching from home, uh, Please let us know. If you'd like a visit or a prayer, please let us know in comments. If you want to visit, please put your address in the comments and we'll make sure that I get by and see you. And as you are able, let us please stand at the reading of Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightst be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Judges, behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew 
put a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, Else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks You may be seated. A year had passed. All was so quiet that it would appear that, that David had literally gotten away with murder. In all that time, the record is silent whether God said anything to, to the man of God's own heart or not. Certainly, life had gone on as usual. Well, we, we really can't say that David's life was usual. It, was more, it would be more accurately described as bizarre and decadent. David had sinned, and some people might say that maybe God was not paying attention, or, or maybe he was asleep. Have you ever sinned and thought it was so minor that maybe God would let you slide? Maybe the sin was major. And you said, well, everybody else is doing it. That makes it okay. If we are honest with ourselves, then we are going to realize that this long litany of sins is not only about David. It's about us as well. Sin pervades our lives. Sin is a problem perennial feature and facet of being a human being. We often test God's limits. Especially in our youthful, prodigal moments of recklessness. And some might even say, well, and I've heard some theologians, theologians say that, well, maybe God needs to wake up. Maybe he needs an upgrade from all those old ancient laws. They just don't fit in today's time. And our lax trends, they just don't fit in now. Maybe God needs upgrading. Or maybe many have believed in this prosperity theology. The idea that God God wants us to be rich, to have fun, be successful, have status and a grand self-esteem. So we might become a, a just a little bit self-absorbed. But that doesn't make all that true, does it? For a very long time, the world believed second century astronomer Ptolemy. They believed in this theory that all the planets and the sun revolved around the earth. And this was believed for about 1400 years before Copernicus came along with his theory and with his proof that the sun, not the earth, is the center of our galaxy. And thus the earth and all the planets revolve around the sun. It's known as the Copernicus Revolution. We all sometimes need a Copernican Revolution in our lives to reshape 
<laughs> our thinking that the world and everything else does not revolve around us. We need to realize it's about God and the glory of God. Let's get back to David. David was set. God had set him up living in this fine palace. Even the contributions from the Palestine's king Hiram had sent timbers and laborers. David unified the government. He was, a, he was sitting atop of the world, had a horde of wives and women. But how David won his wife Bathsheba was sheer, premeditated evil. One day God's prophet Nathan brings David's sin to his consciousness. And he brought it before him in a creative parable about a rich man who takes a poor man's only pet, a lamb, slays it, and then cooks it with savory seasonings and serves it to his guests at an elaborate dinner. And it leaves the poor man with nothing. Not even his beloved lamb. David, in his kingly role, was also the head judge, the Supreme Court judge, you might say. So he enters an accurate verdict in the case that Nathan had described to him. This man should be put to death, David says. And Nathan immediately looks at David and tells him what everyone else was afraid to tell him. You are thou man, that man. You are the man, David, that did this. That little parable powerfully brings home the full significance of David's sin. Nathan, to, to safely speak truth to the powerful king, use this parable. And it paves the way for, for David's objectivity. David, after hearing this, recognizes that he sinned. Even if he has suppressed it under a, a truckload of justification and explainable Necessity. Folks, often sin distorts our good judgment of ourselves, causing us to become immune to the sting of morality. Our impartiality to decipher right from wrong is lost. Why? Well, because it is us. Who's doing it? And the means, as we sometimes try to make an excuse, the means justifies the end. Self-preservation evokes our exclusionary nature and nullifies the ability to self-judge with detachment, with independence, and with neutrality. As God would see it. In the spring of, the, of that year, the time when kings go to battle, David sent for Joab. David stayed in, in the comfort of his home to, to execute the strategy. When good kings normally go out to battle, David was neglecting his day job. In a And in a calculated, lustful quest for a gorgeous married woman, David relaxes on his veranda one evening and checks out Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. She was bathing and David commands his servants to, to go get her and bring her to him. And she comes to him. Maybe because, well, David was the king. He had called for her. 
The young king's hormones were, were raging. And David sinned. Scripture says he lay with her. The king enjoyed the royal prerogative of a little rendezvous. And after returning home, Bathsheba, after a little while, sends word to David. I'm pregnant. Now these words launch a, a tumultuous domino effect of deception and violence. First, it was, David attempted to shift the presumption of fatherhood until Uriah said, no, Uriah's the father. And then came murder. The Apostle Paul, I believe, sums it up. When he says in Romans chapter 7 verses 18 through 24, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work. What? A wretched man I am. We all know about King David. And, and we hear this story and it might be hard for us to imagine. You know, David's life was, he was fully loved by God. But yet he unbelievably trespassed more than half of the Ten Commandments. God, a man after God's own heart who we thought perfect and on the right track. David, the singer of psalms and a harpist. A shepherd and a brilliant kingdom administrator. Fierce lion and bear slayer. Conqueror of the Philistine giant Goliath. Mighty warrior. Retriever of the ark of God. Delivering it with praise to the gates of of Jerusalem. David, who, whom women celebrated singing, Saul hath killed thousands, and David his ten thousands. The one anointed king three times, once for God, once for Judah, and once for Israel. Mightily blessed and highly favored, one after God's own heart. An ancestor of Christ himself, fearfully and wonderfully made. What does that tell us? If a man like this can fall, what does that tell us? That bright, brilliant, good men and women are also vulnerable to sin. No one is too good. No one has no need for grace. And on the other hand, no one is so bad to be beyond the scope of mercy. To acknowledge David's sinfulness. Well, it annihilates our, our whole world view that God uses sinless saints and not sinners. The writer of Samuel's version... Well, tells it like it is. We observe that even the anointed of God can be deeply flawed. Now the canonical account of David, David's reign in the book of Chronicles completely leaves out that story. The book of Kings elevates David the highest when compared to, to all the other kings. But yet, we see he's not perfect. Far from it. And David, compounding his sin, shows his coldness as he confronts the distraught army leader, Joab, saying, Do not let this matter trouble you. For the sword devours now one, and now another. 
Yeah, David, you're the man. Greedy. Vain. Egotistical. Neglecting the art and the truths. Leading to lust. Leading to coveting another's wife. Leading to deception. Leading to adultery. Leading to lies. Ultimately leading to murder. As if a life is as insignificant commodity. Spun out of control so, so that one sin begat another and another sin and still another. But God's last word was the thing that David did displeased the Lord. Second Samuel 12, 7 through 8. Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah and all. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Because the pursuit had become a priority. And a preoccupation above seeking God. And the devaluation of love for others. God judges David's sin. And he says in broad daylight what you've done in the dark of night. In other words, it will all come to light. And they do. David's house does see judgment throughout his life. Just as we see it and when we read his story. And we see that the sword never leaves David's house. If you want to read a story about a dysfunctional family. Make sure you read the story of David. You think your family's messed up. But yet the good news of the gospel is God's unyielding grace. David prays. God grants forgiveness faithfully to those who call upon His name in humbleness and repentance from their wicked ways. When they, as Riley said during the children's sermon, I'm sorry. I have heard about the revival that was going on up in Kentucky. And I've heard folks here talk about revival. If you crave a revival, a revival will come when you experience a confrontation with God just like David did. Revival comes in facing the facts and confessing guilt. It's a good pattern to pray for mercy. To call upon God's unfailing grace. His love. And great compassion. To blot out sin. And none of this we can do on our own. We need to realize our limits. And grace will abound. Self-reliance renders us absolutely powerless against the adversary. And David admits that his sins are absolutely vertical between him and God. But also... Hit the relationships with pe hit the people around him. Those horizontal relationships are also destroyed. Righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. David asked to be made new from the inside out. David asks for only spiritual gifting, truth, wisdom, 
purging, a newly created pure heart, and a right spirit. Not once did he ask for, for temporary possessions. He didn't even ask to keep Bathsheba. He only asked for forgiveness and what God can offer through His Spirit. And He recognizes the power of God's Spirit. It is by God's Spirit alone that He had performed all the mighty acts that I mentioned earlier. He likely recalls the frightening sight when God removed His Spirit from King Saul. King Saul was left emotionally devastated and went insane. We, as God's people, need to pray for forgiveness and reconciliation. But we need never pray for God's Spirit to be removed. Why? Because Jesus promised that the Spirit would be with every believer forever. He says, and I will ask the Father. And He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. I know without a shadow of a doubt, with 100% certainty, that God forgives. I'm living proof of it. I can also tell you with 100% assuredness that God has compassion for us. The true love and the abundant grace of God outweighs any sin that you could ever commit. Even sins like David that left a trail of carnage behind him. And God even weaves sin into redemptive purposes. And without erasing the consequences of their first child born from infidelity, that child died. But God weaves a blessing out of the mess between David and Bathsheba, their second child, King Solomon, who rebuilt the temple or built the temple and is in the genealogy one of Christ's ancestors. Regardless of what we've done in life, God's grace is sufficient. Even in the weakest moment, God incorporates and transforms sin into salvation. In the divine, perfect providence. Sin is not an automatic death sentence. But there's a pardon. A pardon of free, unmerited, freely given grace. And folks, God's grace answers the human condition. There is no difference and there is no respecter of person. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. And yes, God's love for us is genuine and deep. So much so that He sent Jesus to pay redemption's price as our pardon, making atonement through faith in His blood. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And through His grace, we can grow, go from murder to mercy. Thanks be to God. And let the church say. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join with us in singing hymn number 472.
Let us receive the benediction. Whatever wilderness the Spirit has brought you to, walk in boldness as the beloved children of God. 